and welcome to episode 9, all about chapter 12, Flight to the Ford of Fellowship of the Ring, being the ninth part of That's What I'm Talking About. My name is Mary Clay. If that's too complicated for you, just call me MC. And today I am joined by Kiara Kalmi from the Unreliable Narrators Podcast. Welcome. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Yay. Also, did I say your last name right after we just talked about I think how you to did. pronounce your last name? Okay, cool. Because <laughs> as soon as it was out of my mouth, I was like, I don't think I said that right. I've done that with all. people too. And I'm like, Wait, that's not it. I'm one of those people that when I meet someone new, I'm focused so hard. Like when they're like, hi, my name is, and my brain is like, listen, listen hard and pay attention to what their name is so you can remember it. And by that point, they've already said their name and then I don't remember their name. They're just like, hey, buddy, come here. (laughs) What's up? I'm not going to ask you again because that's going to be awkward and you're going to think that I'm a terrible person for not listening. (laughs) Yeah, so welcome. Tell the the listeners at home, how did you get into Lord of the Rings? I wish it was a fantastic story of epic proportions, but in reality, I've loved reading ever since I was little. When I was much younger, my dad mentioned to me, hey, you should read The Hobbit. I think you would like it. And because I was a little kid, for some reason, I was like, ew, no, even though I didn't know what it was about. And then whenever I was, I think around in my tweens, I read The Hobbit for a book club absolutely fell in love with it and then I'm not sure how much later I ended up going through and reading Lord of the Rings as well and it took me forever to get through it because it was so wordy and I was still young and I was just like this take taking forever I know I'm 24 and I have issues <laughs> <laughs> but I did get through I it to, like, eventually it over and over and I'm here now yes yeah yeah I was gonna say you'd be in trouble if you hadn't gotten through it <laughs> through with it and now you're on a podcast about <laughs> I totally love them. That frog and (laughs) Samantha, you know, they're great people. Yeah. It's funny you say that your dad initially recommended it to you because I've had so many people on the podcast say, oh yeah, my dad introduced me to it or my dad and I watched the movies when I was little and blah, blah, blah. I guess this is just a dad book. I guess so. If I ever have kids, (laughs) I need to be the one that says it. Be like, no, this is going to be a mom thing. Let's let's read The Hobbit, children. (laughs) I feel like if I like ever get married and decide to have kids or anything, I would come up with like a contract about like, okay, these are the things that I get to introduce the children to. (laughs) And these are the things that you can introduce the children to. I feel like hopefully I end up marrying the right person and we end up fighting over who gets to introduce Harry Potter. (laughs) Yes, that would be fun though. My dog is named after Luna Lovegood from Harry Potter. (gasps) So I feel like if I ever have any actual kids, I'll probably be like named after characters. (laughs) Luna is on my, I have an ongoing, I have a, on my notes app, I have an ongoing list of dog names and Luna is on there. (laughs) It's a great dog name. Yeah, she's sweet. I love her. Man, I just, I just really, I I, um, just moved out of my parents' house like a month ago and away from our family dog. And I'm just sad all the time because I'm not with my dog anymore. (laughs) Time to get another dog. I know, but I don't trust myself yet. I'm like, well, I know I can take care of a dog. It's the fact that like I'm on a third floor apartment and I firmly believe that I am so lazy that I just wouldn't be motivated to like take them on walks every day just so they could like go to the bathroom and I wouldn't want to get up early. And I'm like, dog? Yes. Responsibilities? No. No. (laughs) Not ready for that. So another thing I'm not ready for is our question of the day because I forgot to look one up before we started recording and I don't want to waste time digging through the DMs and stuff. So listeners, if you have a question that you'd like to be discussed or thought about, it could be fun, it could be serious, as long as it's non-spoilery, send a DM to at Tolkien About Pod on Twitter or Instagram and I might ask it in the future. That's all I promise. Okay. (laughs) So kicking off with chapter 12, Flight to the Ford. And this is the last chapter of book one of Fellowship of the Ring, which I think is so unnecessary that he divided it into two books. I didn't even remember that until I was going through it to read back again. And then I was like, oh, they're divided into quote unquote books. That's 
interesting. Yeah. And like, I, I understand like this is the dramatic break in the book and everything, but it honestly, yeah. just for my purposes, because I know Tolkien was thinking of some dumb girl doing a podcast about his books when he wrote these books. It sets up some confusion sometimes and some worries when I'm like trying to coordinate guests and I have to like specify and I'm like, okay, chapter 12 of book one of Fellowship <laughs> of the Ring, because it, they might get confused and think that I'm farther along and do chapter 12 of, I don't think there is a chapter 12 of book two. But that's beside the point. <laughs> so where we last left our quote unquote hero Frodo, he <laughs> very unwittingly attacked the Black Riders. Well, I guess he it wasn't his fault because he was under the power of the ring or the temptation or whatever. And then he passed out and blacked out. And that's all we know. And then yep. my prediction, I was laughing at myself when I read like the first sentence because my prediction at the end of the previous chapter slash episode was that, oh, I've heard that by the end of this, by the end of book one, they make it to Rivendell. So they have a lot of ground to cover. I bet you the next chapter will kick off with a nice time jump to when Frodo wakes up and they're magically in Rivendell because he was passed out the entire trip. Nope, it literally starts off like five minutes later. <laughs> Tolkien is just like, we did one big time jump in the beginning, and now you're going to live every painstaking moment of these characters' lives oh, from here on man. out. He's just like, he's all over the place with his time, because it takes like five chapters for five days to pass, and then in this chapter, like seven days pass within the course of two paragraphs. I know, it's so hard to catch up with sometimes. You're just like, wait, where are we? What day is it? What year is it? What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> and I really, I want to make the meme of, it's the guy choosing between, it's like two buttons and he's like sweating between which one to choose. Oh yeah. I want to make one where one of the buttons is jump ahead in time, 15 years. And then the other button is like spend a hundred pages over the course of two days. <laughs> and then it's Tolkien just deciding what to do. That would be a wonderful meme. 10 out of 10 would retweet it. That would be hilarious. It's Thank so you. timely. Thank you. I did major in memes. Um, I didn't major in memes. I majored in communication and, and one of my classes happened to be about memes, which I still can't believe happened. A worthy undertaking, in my opinion. <laughs> it was great class. It was honestly really interesting. And and I was just the, the nerd. <laughs> All my friends would like be sharing a meme and I'd be like, well, actually, do you know... The origin of the word meme, it comes from the word memetic language, which means, and I'm like, no one wants that person there when they're just trying to share some dank memes with Tumblr. <laughs> now I'm kind of curious, though, because I never thought about the origin of the word meme. Well, oh. honestly, I don't remember at this point, but I know it does come from the word meme. It, it comes from the phrase mimetic language and i think mimetic had something to do with like very easily passed around and very easily uh, like quickly or swiftly communicated which makes huh. sense when you think about like what a meme is i'd not expect for this to be so educational man i love it i know you learn something new every day <laughs> yeah so basically no time has passed frodo wakes up and he's been injured and um the three hobbits are flipping out because <laughs> I didn't really think about what they were seeing from their perspective because so Frodo puts the ring on and he yeah. goes invisible and he can see the Black Riders and they're these creepy people underneath the hoods and stuff. But from the Hobbit's perspective, he Frodo just disappears and then the Black Riders are like running around in the dark <laughs> because they're shadows or they look like shadows or whatever. And then the next thing they know, the Riders are going... First of all, the next thing they know, Aragorn's jumping out with two flaming sticks of fire. <laughs> the riders are running off, and then Frodo appears. Frodo just magically appears, and they think he's dead. So that's going to be insane. That must have been a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I don't remember much about the movie, and I don't think this would have been in it. But just, I really, really wish that there's a scene somewhere of Aragorn jumping out of the bushes with two sticks on fire. <laughs> I love Aragorn so much. As I was rereading this, 
it, like I said, it's been so long since I've read it. It's like, I don't remember a lot of, like, little details. So as I'm reading this and, like, reading some of the chapters before this, too, I was just thinking, okay, I love all four of these hobbits. They're all wonderful, but they're such idiots. <laughs> like, oh my God, they just, like, they're so dumb. Oh, we're tired? Let's, you know, go stand, sit right here by this big stone that probably is evil after Tom told us to keep going and let's just sit here and sleep. I'm just like, guys. Oh, man. Which is why, like, we're so glad that our man Strider slash Aragorn, who at this point is still being referred to in the book as Strider. True. I don't know if I'm going to get, like, hate tweets for referring to him as Strider when he's Aragorn or referring to him as Aragorn when the book is still calling him Strider. But anyway. <laughs> oh, so they're recounting what happened after Frodo, after Frodo passed out. And they ran away and Strider comes back and kind of instructs them to help Frodo move him closer to the fire and all this stuff. And Strider basically explains that the riders, this is, this is like what I was making fun of Frodo for, is that like, he's a tiny little hobbit. His, what is, his sword is technically like a human normal size knife or dagger. Yes. And... He's a tiny person, and he's going up against these evil beings. What did he think would happen? Well, apparently, it somehow scared them away. This is, like, what I was confused about, because Strider says that he doesn't think that the... He, he says, I don't think they expected to be resisted. So, basically, it wasn't Frodo's attack. It was that... It was the surprise of the Hobbit attacking them that like made them run away i think it's like meeting a tiny dog like a chihuahua or something you're like oh you're so small and cute and then like it turns out to be really vicious and mean and you're just like what is happening oh no that is what they were like I they're like why are you barking at us small chihuahua honestly chihuahua is the best comparison i've ever heard for frodo because that's exactly what he is. <laughs> like all of the hub i mean like there are Many, many nice chihuahuas, but I bet you the hobbits, when they are thinking they're attacking, and kind of at the, the end of this chapter, too, they're like, oh, we're so mean and vicious, but really, they're just a small chihuahua. I'm just imagining, like, these little chihuahuas just, like, yipping and, like, baring their little teeth, but they're just, like, short and tiny. That's wonderful. <laughs> and then I was... Uh, also reminded of the wonderful John Mulaney bit from his, I think it's his most recent um, comedy special on Netflix. And he talks about the uh, detective, Detective J.J. Bittenbinder, who would come to their elementary school and t talk about stranger danger. And one of the things that like the detective would talk, he would tell them all these crazy things to like ward off kidnappers or pedophiles. Meanwhile, talk to like an audience of like seven year olds. <laughs> and one of the things he would, he kept telling them is like, he would just tell them to do like random crap just to throw the kidnapper off their rhythm. Throw your backpack at him. That'll throw him off his rhythm and give you an opportunity to run away. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens here is Frodo attacking the writers, <laughs> threw them off their rhythm and gave, well, gave the writers an opportunity to run away. But that's, yeah. When the writers try to, try to like get to him and touch him, Frodo's like, stop, don't touch me. <laughs> this <laughs> is my name. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger danger. <laughs> oh man, do you think how different would these books be if there had been like a Stranger Danger class in Hobbiton? <laughs> Because the hobbits are exactly the kind of people who would who would be like, oh, a man says he has candy and puppies in his van? Sounds good to me. I like food. Let's go. And you know what? Honestly, kind of expecting that at one point they will be detracted by someone being like, oh, you look tired and hungry. You want to come to my house? I have food and I have beds. And they'll be like, yeah, sounds great. And then they'll go into the house and then they'll get ambushed or something i actually cannot remember if that ever does happen but it would not surprise me <laughs> yeah yeah like if it if that ever happens i'm just gonna do like a hard cut to this moment of me being like ha i knew it <laughs> i was right i knew it so frodo's wound is 
the it's not an ordinary wound it's the evil kind it's magical and the yeah the um black writers i guess their swords or something are evil or just everything about them is evil and basically when they stab frodo he has some kind of poison in him that slow i, I guess is slowly going to turn him evil or something which at this point i was like so it's a zombie bite basically <laughs> Yeah, it is kind of, they don't, they're not that, they don't explain a lot about what it's going to do. Like, they're partially like, well, he might die, but they're also partially like, he might turn into a ring wraith too. And you're just like, what is happening? What is, what are the Black Riders? Yeah. What is, what is this? So you, it's, it, the peril is kind of weird, because like, you're worried for Frodo, but you're also not really sure what they're saying is going to happen to him, because Aragorn has to be vague. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is, that just made me laugh, throughout this chapter, all of the people, like Aragorn, and then the surprise elf friend we meet later in the chapter, um, I don't know why I'm acting like this is a big reveal, <laughs> what's his name, Gl- Glorfindel. Or Gorfin, I don't know how they say the same. But anyway, that's what I would say it. Probably the thing that makes me laugh is Aragorn is constantly like, "Yeah, this is like way beyond my skill set. I have no idea how to heal this. Even the most talented healers might have trouble." But uh, I'm sure he'll be fine. <laughs> It'll all be good. No worries, Sammy. It'll all be good in the hood. <laughs> Literally says, "I fear Sam." that they believe your master has a deadly wound that will subdue him to their will. We shall see. <laughs> It'll like, be a surprise. Who knows what will happen. Least, yeah, I mean, I know that, like, Aragorn isn't, like, there to, like, comfort them or whatever. And he, the whole point of, or at least at this point in the story, is that Aragorn is there to, like, wake them up to how dumb they're being and kind <laughs> of bring a dose of reality to the gang. Yes. But it's a little bit too much reality. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so as they're holding up the not the sword that stabbed him, I guess at this point the sun is rising because the sword, the blade of it, like melts away. I guess like pull the Thanos and got snapped away. And the only thing that's left is the hilt. And I guess my guess is that it's because cause it says something about the... Oh, yeah, it says... But even as he held it up in the growing light, they gazed in astonishment, for the blade seemed to melt and vanished like a smoke in the air, leaving only the hilt in Strider's hand. Yeah, so it disappeared. And I guess that had, yeah, I guess the growing light. So I guess that had something to do with how, like, the riders, they don't like fire and they are hunting and riding and everything at night. They're in their prime at night, basically. So Aragorn goes off and comes back with a leaf or leaves that apparently have, like, some healing powers. And, again, this is where Tolkien can't resist giving us that little piece of history because Aragorn goes on about, like, oh, yeah, these leaves, like, shouldn't even... i honestly surprised that I found these in this area because they're not known to dwell here. Originally, they grew in the Southern Valley, <laughs> and then they migrated over to the East. And I'm like, Frodo is dying from an <laughs> evil wound and maybe about to turn into a ring wraith maybe you could skip the history lesson and just give him the tea like, maybe we could learn this later like when frodo is not on his deathbed <laughs> yeah like he just pauses to give a little history lesson and before he treats the wound like they're it's like no 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 children you need to understand where this leaf came from so that you can fully appreciate it. You gonna learn today, hobbits. Now watch. <laughs> Look at this. I'm gonna learn you some history. <laughs> and some botany, and it's gonna yep. be great. <laughs> You're gonna be so learned after this. <laughs> I'm gonna school you some botany. <laughs> uh, I love how Aragorn is, like, simultaneously this gruff ranger, you know, says he can hunt and track and do all this, but then he's also just like, here are these herbs, children. Yeah. This is what we're gonna do. He know, yeah, that's like he, I think in the previous chapter two, the hobbits are wondering like, how old is this dude, and where did he learn all of these stories? <laughs> like, he, I yeah. guess he just, I mean, actually, si- nah, I'm gonna backtrack on that, because I guess it makes sense that he would know about this, because he's a ranger, and he goes out into the woods to do manly things and 
has to live <laughs> off the land. Which, side note, they make a point throughout this chapter that, like, oh, the rations are running low and the breakfast was very meager and they're getting hungry. Are, they're with a person who could probably hunt. Like, are there no other, are there no berries? Are there no vegetables growing in the ground or <laughs> rabbits? Or I don't know what the, the flora and fauna of Middle Earth is or the Shire. I don't even know if we're in the Shire still at this point. I but don't believe we are. I know. Thank the Lord. We're not in the Shire anymore. Um, <laughs> I did not... When people were, would like joke with me and be like, oh yeah, people always like make fun, make fun of how long they're in the Shire and it's a hundred pages in and oh, you're still in the Shire. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's funny. Ha ha ha. And then it was happening and I was like, they're still in the Shire. Yeah. Cause I always, I always think, oh yeah, the Shire's just Hobbiton. It's that little small thing. And then you forget, yeah. especially until you like reread the books or read them for the first time, if you've already seen the movies, and you're just like, whoa, there is more Shire than I thought. I even have a map of Middle Earth on my wall. And I even then, I still am just like, oh yeah, the Shire's really small. And you're like, oh, it's actually a bit bigger than I thought. Because we're still here. Yeah, I think I need a, a map of the, sh- of not the Shire, a map of Middle Earth on my wall so I can just like look at it for reference points throughout the series because i i have very awful maps in my copy and some of them there's like one at the front and then a couple of them are split apart at the back but even then they're not that like the other thing is look i don't exact i don't have like bad eyesight and i'm not old or anything but (laughs) i'm like the print is so small can you not make it a little bit bigger on these maps please for my strained eyes because I'll fall asleep with my phone two inches from my <laughs> eyes and the pitch black with the brightness all the way up. Where was I? Yes, we were with Aragorn's history lesson and then soon-ish after, well, they come across the stone trolls and then we get Glorfindel. Well, uh, backtrack, uh, backtracking a little bit. Conf- at one point or another, they I can't remember if it's here or if after they've taken off at first. At one point or another, Another. Strider takes Mary with him to survey the land, which just further confirms my belief that Mary is the superior hobbit. <laughs> That Strider was looking at the the three able-bodied hobbits and was like, you, you're the most okayest at this point. Come with me, child. Let's yeah, look upon your, this land. One of your earlier episodes I was listening to today where uh, you and your guests were talking about how it's like a family road trip and like Mary's the dad and Pippin's like a little brother. And that fits so well because it is Mary's like the only one that he's like... You could probably do it, but Pippin, I don't know that I trust you, boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to take you along. Yeah. And then I highlighted here, uh, as Frodo is kind of like lying, writhing in pain, trying not to die, <laughs> says, he was, he's reflecting on what happened. And he says, for he now perceived that in putting on the ring, he obeyed not his own desire, but the commanding wish of his enemies. So this is when I start wondering, why are they not trading the ring off like it's the Horcrux in Deathly Hallows? Like it's the locket? If it has such an irresistible power, why doesn't like Sam hold on to it for a little bit of time and then pip it? Because Gandalf's thing was, oh, I don't I don't want to have it because I'm powerful it's safer with you, little hobbit boy. Well, there are three <laughs> other hobbits with him. Like, I can understand maybe not wanting to give it to Aragorn because maybe he would be more dangerous with it. But, like, just is there some, like, and again, you don't remember, you do not have to respond to this question at all. But, like, is there some prophecy or reason for why Frodo has to be carrying the ring because it would things would go so much smoother if they would just like pass it along and take shifts carrying it or at least someone keep it away from Frodo from this point (laughs) on so he can't put it on like yeah Yeah, that would be a smart idea you would think that'd be good I don't know if maybe it's because then if it started affecting all of them because like I don't know the Mm -hmm. Maybe the power would go away. Good. You know, Frodo only had it out for a few hours. And then we're going to have, like, four 
little hobbit boy is just like arm wrestling for the ring or something and aragorn's just gonna be like why good point why did i agree to that good point you know what i'll go with that until that theory is proven otherwise and then i'll just start yelling about it again in the future <laughs> why aren't they doing this <laughs> exactly so yes they begin travel they begin traveling and frodo rides on bill fernie's horse which again they make the note that the horse was so like mistreated and malnourished in the ownership or whatever possession of bill fernie that being on this journey has actually improved his health and he's much healthier and like fatter and stronger than he was when they got him he's just so happy he just he's happy to be here yeah and oh i was so i was scrolling through instagram on the Tolkien about instagram and just like scrolling through the discover feature and usually i'll just try i know there are like there are a lot of references to things that i don't know about yet so i'll just scroll past stuff and kind of skim it first and then quickly move away if i think it's going to spoil anything and i accidentally read some read a spoiler but it was the best possible spoiler i could have read and it was a it was just like a it was a picture of i think it was sam pippin and mary from the movie and they're all like smiling happily and it says when you learn that bill the pony gets reunited with sam after everything and i was like oh i don't know who bill the pony is yet but now i'm i guess is it this pony? I hope this is Bill the Pony that we're with right now. Mostly because it just makes me laugh that they would name the pony after the owner they bought it from and just call it Bill the Pony as opposed to Bill the Human. <laughs> I think this one is the one they name Bill, but I don't remember when they do so. I, It's probably Sam, honestly. I don't remember who names him, but knowing Sam, I feel like Sam's the one that's going to. Because like they mentioned in an earlier chapter... That the five, I think it was five horses that Mary had, he just like never named them. And I'm just like, why don't you name your horses, Mary? Why don't you care? He's just too busy. Look, he has a lot of weight to carry on his shoulders as the best hobbit. So he doesn't have time to name his ponies. <laughs> um, So they put, yeah, so they put Frodo on the horse and everyone just kind of trucks along. And then once again, this is where it's like... Within the span of a sentence, it says, Four days passed without the ground or the scene changing much, except that behind them, Weathertop weather slowly sank, and before them, the distant mountains loomed a little nearer. So all we know at this point is that they're traveling. It's essentially just a lot of uneventful traveling for the next several paragraphs. And just kind of comment every now and then they'll ask Strider something. He's like, oh yeah, over there is that river um and over there is that river um but we don't have to cross that river until we get to it so <laughs> let's keep going thanks aragorn <laughs> yeah um and then they get to uh this is where like i don't know i got confused they um oh once again i have highlighted this is just what I was talking about before, it says, Frodo has been touched by the weapons of the enemy, said Strider, and there is some poison or evil at work that is beyond my skill to drive out. But do not give up hope, Sam. <laughs> it's like he's trying to be realistic and encouraging at the same time, but he's not quite sure how. So then they come to these giant doors, I guess. I was kind of confused. When they came to the corner, they looked round and saw that the path ran over a level strip under the face of a low cliff underhung with trees. In the stony wall, there was a door hanging crookedly ajar upon one great hinge. And they go inside and they say, surely this is a troll hole, which like there are so many great words in this series and this book so far and lots of made up words so far. You couldn't have come up with a better word than troll hole. I'm, I was just so confused. I'm like, what is the troll hole? Like, is it a graveyard? I, I'm just confused. Let's see. Strider. So they push open this giant door. It says they did not go far for on the floor lay many old bones and nothing else was to be seen near the entrance except some empty, great empty jars and broken pots. Surely this is a troll hole if ever there was one, said Pippin. So, yeah, I guess there was, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so it was the home of trolls. So that's what a troll hole is. <laughs> it's literally just, 
I guess, the place that a troll makes its home. Kind of like it's like, oh, it's a hobbit hole. It's it's a troll hole. Uh, <laughs> Except so for rhymes. They, you know, maybe we, you know, we probably learned about this in The Hobbit because they make a reference later on to something that Bilbo said or did. And they're like, oh, it really is true. So I guess this is something that happened in The Hobbit. But what happened to the trolls that their bones and stuff are just lying around in there? That's really creepy. But um, all I will say is, yes, that is addressed in The Hobbit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till Good you to get know. to The Hobbit. That's uh, that's my favorite out of Tolkien's works. That's I'm so excited for you to get there. I know it'll be a while because there's hundreds of pages left of material in Lord of the Rings, but still. Oh, so many pages. And like, I'm learning every... D- so I went to... I think it's a chain of... It's these secondhand stores and they sell like DVDs and books and records and stuff called Second and Charles. Oh, I love Second and Charles. Yeah. And I went... To, so I went to one uh, over the weekend and I went to the Lord of the Rings section just to like see what they had. And there were so many random um, books that said like by like J.R.R. Tolkien that weren't the that weren't the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings and like one of them was like the children of Hyrule that Zelda but <laughs> you get my point I was just like how many other things am I gonna have to read that are probably not as exciting as Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit I don't know anyway. um so they come to a uh, Pippin or someone freaks out and is like, oh my god, there's trolls over there. And Strider goes over and pokes them with a stick. And <laughs> you find out that these are trolls that have been turned into stone. Ooh, ah. <laughs> and yes, this is where it hints at something that Bilbo encountered or did. And before they end up, um, before they even like get to this point in the story, Frodo wonders like, oh, I wonder if we're in troll country. I wonder where we are because I remember Bilbo saying this is about saying that was where his first adventure or whatever happened while he was gone on his larger adventure or whatever. So yes, we find out that something happened. And the trolls turned into stone. And we don't exactly know what happened, but I'm assuming that's all covered in The Hobbit. So I'm not going to worry about it. I mean, I know, but... Yeah, (laughs) I don't. Okay, I'll rephrase that. I don't know what happened. (laughs) But you know what? Honestly, I don't care because I will learn about it in the future. And I'm like, I'm sure that knowing the history of how these trolls turned into stone will not come up again. In the fa- you know, no, I need to backtrack again because I said that. <laughs> I said that in the last episode that I was like, I'm sure that this story of Tenuvi- Luth- Luthien, Tenuvial, and Baron isn't that important. And I'm sure it doesn't mean anything. And then after the episode came out, someone messaged me on Instagram and said, oh, you know that the names Luthien and Baron are on Tolkien's gravestone with him and his wife, right? And I was like, I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Then Sam sings a lovely song that I skimmed. Um, (laughs) After the song ends, uh, Frodo says, I am learning a lot about Sam Gamgee on this journey. First, he was a conspirator. Now he's a jester. He'll end up by becoming a wizard or a warrior. And I'm like, same, Frodo. I am also learning a lot about Sam Gamgee on this journey. Because when he started out, I was very annoyed with him. And now I'm only slightly annoyed with him. I was going to ask if you liked him any better now. I was definitely really... I never... It's not like I ever hated Sam. I was just mostly Mm -hmm. annoyed by him. And (laughs) then now... I just kind of have neutral feelings about him. I'm like, yeah, he's there, but you're okay. You know who's also there? Mary, the superior <laughs> hobbit. Hobbit number one. Yeah. Also, oh, that's right. I did read the poem slash song because I wrote down. So the song references a guy named Tom who comes up to, I guess, talk to the battle the trolls or fights with the trolls. Is this Tom Bombadil? Do we, I mean, I know we know nothing about Tom Bombadil and we never know anything. We never learn anything more about Tom Bombadil, but I feel like it just says, up came Tom with his big boots on. And then it's all about Tom with this troll. Like it has to be Tom Bombadil. Only Tom Bombadil could be in this song. (laughs) That's actually the same thing I thought whenever he was saying Tom, I was like, Tom? Though then like the part you were reading Frodo realizes that it wasn't a song that Sam had heard, it was one he made up, 
So, because he says it's out of his own head, of course. So I'm guessing that maybe Tom Bombadil was on the mind. Oh, I see again talking about how I'm a 24 year old who can't comprehend the English language. Apparently, when he, when he said it's out of his own head, of course, I thought he just meant like when they're like, "Where did that song come from?" I thought he meant like, "Oh, well, it's out of his head," as in as in he had it memorized, and that's where it came. Oh, okay. Your your interpretation is probably <laughs> more accurate and makes more sense. They. Are are traveling and stop and they get freaked out because they hear literally clippity clippity clip as it's described in the book and they're like ah the black riders but plot twist you see a white horse which you immediately know ah it's the good guys because it's a white horse symbolism i love the entrances of elves in this book i know they've only been in entered twice <laughs> i know they've only entered twice so far i think or had like an official entrance but i really love them because i'm just imagining like there's an ever present like breeze <laughs> just blowing in their hair and there's always like a little bit of sunlight just like shining on them in just the right angle pretty much so it says the writer's cloak streamed behind him and his hood was thrown back his golden hair flowed, shimmering in the wind of his speed. To Frodo, it appeared that a white light was shining through the form. And what is that word? Raiment? R-A-I-M-E-N-T of the writer. Yes. What is that? Hey Siri, what does the word raiment mean? Raiment is an archaic and literary term. It means clothing. <laughs> Clothing. I it's love also, how dramatic she cut it is. It means clothing. clothing. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I also like that she specifies that it's archaic. It's an archaic word. Anyway, so. Anyway, to Frodo, it appeared that a white light was shining through the form and raiment of the writer as if through a thin veil. So again, just imagining a spotlight and and the wind blowing in his hair and this and strider runs over and is like ah my good old buddy and they speak elven language elvish what whatever strider's like fear not friends this is glorfindel which i immediately ruined the moment for me because i was like oh wow look at this majestic elf i'm sure he's gonna have a beautiful name glorfindel <laughs> it sounds like a german candy glorfindel or glor glor i i kept i just sat there for like a minute or two just repeatedly saying glorfindel trying to figure <laughs> out if i was saying it wrong if there was a different way to like glor glorfindel Glor Glorfindel. Glorfindel. Glor <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just kept like repronouncing it to be like, is there a different way to say this that doesn't sound like a German language? Um, <laughs> That reminds me of a joke that the one YouTuber Thomas Sanders had done when he and another YouTuber, Brizzy Voices, were doing like, what if real animals said their names like Pokemon, like what would it sound like? And he did one for an <laughs> elephant and, and it was like him trying to say elephant as you trumpeted. And then he's like, imagine like the first person that is that saw the elephant there, they're like, look at that ancient majestic creature. Elephant Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it makes you think of. Look at that wonderful, beautiful elf. Hi, my name is Glorfindel. <laughs> okay. And so he said, we find out that he left. Shoot, where are they going to? The Ford. I don't know where the, does the Ford have a different name? The Ford of, it just says flight to the Ford. They're going, the Ford is uh, like an, not like an entryway, but it's like on the way to Rivendell, which okay. is where they're going. The elven home place. Got it. I should also mention that at one point before all before this happens strider at one point goes ahead is like stay here i'm gonna go check out everything and he goes over to this bridge and he comes back with something sorry my friend just <laughs> I, I think my friend must be listening to episode eight because she just texted me about there being a fourth Aragon book, which we talk about in episode eight about the Aragon books. <laughs> and apparently there's a fourth one. Oh my. <laughs> she just texts me in all caps, says, <laughs> there is a fourth Aragon book. I couldn't do it. 
Oh, so it sounds like she has experience with the Aragon series. Bethany, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, so I, so I know that friend who texted me is Bethany, the guest of episode five, possibly. I don't remember. Hey, Bethany. Episode four, <laughs> episode five, six. Who knows at this point? So, yeah. So Strider goes to a bridge and comes back with this, like, green jewel and says, oh, this is an el- This is an elfish, el- el- elfish, el- elvish jewel and says this is a sign of good of good luck or good omen or whatever and we'll be good from here on out no he doesn't say that but he's like (laughs) we'll probably be a little bit more okay than we were before so (laughs) come along children um and then that's when we this is where we find out that glorfindel had left the ford a couple days beforehand or left rivendell there we go yeah i think he left rivendell yeah he left rivendell Because he knew that they should have been expecting them or something. And he had a feeling that was a correct feeling that they might have been running into some trouble. So he runs out and has been traveling around trying to track them down and see where they are. And he's... Says He's talking about the messages that he's heard, and it says that you were astray, bearing a great burden without guidance, for Gandalf had not returned. Boy, oh boy, is that like the understatement. Astray, (laughs) bearing a great burden without guidance. I mean, yeah, if you want to simplify it. Sure, that's what's happened. I.e. like dying, almost dying out in the wilderness million times because the hobbits can't do anything without Aragorn. I'm so glad Aragorn's here because he at least oh my God. I mean like he may be a little fatalistic with Frodo and stuff but at least he has some sense. Oh my gosh. So much more sense than all of the hobbits combined. <laughs> <laughs> Except so for Mary. <laughs> Mary's the superior. The superior hobbit. I will die on this hill. <laughs> That's a bold statement for me to make when I am Halfway through one of three books about that involve Mary. I want to make that a hashtag. Hashtag Mary the the Superior. superior. (laughs) Get it trending, y'all. Hashtag (laughs) Mary the Superior. So Glorfindel uh, says, all right, you can ride on my fancy beautiful horse and we'll get you to the ford. No problem. And Frodo says, "Um, I'm... Oh, so yeah. So Glorfindel says, you shall ride my horse. I will shorten the stirrups. I like that he has to shorten the stirrups so the little hobbit boy can sit up there. But <laughs> His little legs. Says, but you need not fear. My horse will not let any rider fall that I command him to bear. His pace is light and smooth. If danger presses too near, he will bear you away with a speed that even the black steeds of the enemy cannot rival. Frodo is concerned at this point because he's like, no, I don't want to leave my friends behind in danger. And this is when Glorfindel... I don't know, spills the tea, gives Frodo a wake-up call, whatever. And he says, I doubt very much if your friends would be in danger if you were not with them. The pursuit would follow you and leave us in peace, I think. It is you, Frodo, and that which you bear that brings us all this peril. Oh, burn. I don't know, just kind of, I don't know, just got a little chuckle that he's like, yeah, I'm gonna tell you what's real, and it's that you're the one in danger, you dummy. (laughs) Your friends will be fine if you go running ahead. Also, I had to reread, talking about not being, it. like, this is such a a wordy but beautiful uh, written book. I had to re and not being able to understand any of it. I had to reread that sentence. I doubt very much if your friends would be in danger if you were not with them. I had to reread that like five times. I was like, what does this mean? I, I was like, it's a double negative. So it says that he thinks he would be okay then? Uh, <laughs> I know. I, I have was... to do that sometimes with some books, and especially with like older books like this, like the way that they structure their word, their phrasing. I'm just like, bro, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. Also, can I take a quick minute to say how much I love Elvish horses? Like, it's just like, oh yeah, my horse will never let you fall. He'll obey any command, and he's like as fast as the speed of light, and I'm like, sweet, I want one. I just like yeah. all the horses. They're so And he's also, yeah, his, his pace is light and smooth. Like, it's got to be some kind of a magical, beautiful horse. Like, it's got to, also, it's a probably a fair step up from Bill Fernie's <laughs> sickly little pony. <laughs> from Bill the Pony. 
Like, imagine, imagine those two ponies just, like, standing next to each other while all the humans are talking, and they're just looking at each other, and Bill Fernie's pony is like, how can I compete with that? He just, like, tries to straighten his little neck and puff out his chest, like, I'm like, important, too. He's like, I am almost dying, but I'm still alive, and you are the most glorious beast I've ever seen in the world. <laughs> So they continue moving on. And yeah, like you mentioned before, the hobbits are like, mm, but we're tired. Can we like rest for a little bit? I feel Corporate, so much. Corporate tells like, no, the riders are right behind us. We have to keep going. So they go and kind of stop and take breaks. And at one point they're going. And then this is where I guess I was like so caught up in the action that I I barely wrote. I didn't write down anything. I have one note about the very like end of this chapter, like the last couple of paragraphs. So we're winging it here, folks, because I guess I was like, wow, the action, it's happening. <laughs> they're riding along and then they hear it. They hear the Black Riders. Dun, dun, dun. And the five of them that attacked them, like, I guess a week before at this point, are behind them. And Glorfindel tells Frodo to run ahead and, or I guess, I wonder if he's, I wonder if he's commanding the horse. Oh, no, it says to Frodo. Well, I answered my own question. Great. He does call the horse then later on because Frodo won't go. Because it says, ride on, ride on, cried Glorfindel. And then loud and clear, he called to the horse in the elf tongue. Nor a limb, nor a limb, Asphaloth. Whatever that means. Wow, beautiful pronunciation. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't speak Elvish. I would have just stopped <laughs> and been like, and then he says some Elvish things. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and so Frodo rides ahead, and this is where they see. So the whole time throughout throughout this chapter, they've been like, well. The five riders are there. We know there are nine of them, but we don't know where the other four are. Hmm. Eh, let's not worry about it. <laughs> the other four are here, ready to ambush them. And basically, two, I think it's like two of them. Yeah, it says, <clears throat> clearing my throat. <laughs> now I'm choking. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> At the same moment, the black horses leaped down the hill in pursuit. And from the riders came a terrible cry, such as Frodo had heard filling the woods with horror in the east farthing way, way far away. Great, I already messed up that passage. It's fine. It was answered, and to the dismay of Frodo, his friends came out from the trees and rocks away on the left. Four other riders came flying. Two rode towards Frodo, two galloped madly toward the ford to cut off his escape. They seemed to him to run like the wind and to grow swiftly larger and darker as their courses converged with him. Ooh, so it's very epic. And honestly, it's almost like, it's very, it's a little bit like a Western, like this is a showdown on horseback at this point. (laughs) It's very cinematic. Like I can see it in my head and not even like thinking of the movie or anything, just in general, I could definitely see him going and they're getting closer in front of him. Yeah, the like epic music and I'm imagining like a wide sweeping shot showing the writers coming out and, and cutting off his path and Frodo the horse takes him across a river and Frodo says says, with a great effort Frodo sat upright and branches his sword go back he cried go back to the land of Mordor and follow me no more and then the riders laugh at him and say we're gonna take you to Mordor (laughs) and then they're like and also the ring Frodo says by Elbereth and Luthien the fair, said Frodo with the last effort, lifting up his sword, you shall have neither the ring nor me. Which I'm like, wow, those are some big words for a man who is pretty much dying from an evil zombie bite. And then this is where, once again, Frodo gets very lucky. A huge swell of like waves or I guess um, water from the river comes up and washes the riders away or prevents them from crossing the river white oh and this is also where i was like i know exactly what this is because all i saw were the words white flames and i was like oh great it's gandalf i was like yeah it's gandalf 100 percent, because it says white flames and we all know that when they talk about fire and something light or white it's gandalf no, this is when it's just describing the cre- like the the white 
crest of the waves where the waves are breaking in the water. It says, white flames seemed to Frodo to flicker on their crests, and he half fancied that he saw amid the water white riders upon white horses with frothing manes. The three riders that were still in the midst of the ford were overwhelmed. They disappeared, buried suddenly under angry foam. Those that were behind drew back in dismay. And then it says, Beyond the riders that hesitated on the shore, a shining figure of white light, and behind it ran small shadowy forms waving flames that flared red in the gray mist that was falling over the world. And then Frodo falls off the horse and passes out again, which is exactly how the previous chapter ended. (laughs) That's what I was going to say. I'm like, we start right where we had ended the last chapter. No, we end right where we had ended the last chapter as well. Yeah, yeah. Frodo saw his pass it out. Yep. And so, um, real now, I now I'm pretty sure when it said as soon as it said a shining figure of white light, I was like, now that better be Gandalf. I better turn the page. And it's like Gandalf was sitting by Frodo's side as he woke from his evil slumber because he's evil now, I guess. <laughs> And this was, uh, I was saying in the previous episode that I haven't had a lot of urgency to be like, oh my gosh, I have to find out what happens next. I'm starting to get that feeling and I'm like, I almost turned the page and started reading the next chapter and I was like, nope, I gotta wait. I'm supposed to wait until I record and then I can read the next chapter. So I'm real excited to see what happens because this is also, it's like the mid-season finale for Fellowship (laughs) of the Ring. Um, Now I'm going to take a three-month hiatus and come back in April. That's not three months, but that's what all the, (laughs) that's what all the, that's, uh, it just always makes me laugh when when TV shows, like the terminology, when they stop having new episodes sometime in November, and then when they come back sometime in the spring, they're like, yeah, it's the winter hiatus. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't have a new episode until April. That's not a winter hiatus. That's a hibernation. And sometimes the hiatuses they take are, like, so random, and I'm just like, why? Like, we were in the middle of this, like, we just, like, just had five episodes of this first season, and now all of a sudden, we're, like, gone, and we're, and I want to know what happened. It's like, I'm, you owe me this much. (laughs) Just stay on a consistent schedule, please. So, yeah, what an exciting, epic chapter. What What did you think about that? Thoughts, feelings. It was exciting. I love all the horses that are in here. They're all good boys. <laughs> and I think I remember, I always like whatever characters are in peril because I was like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Like, if a character is injured, I always like like the feels of everyone else being like, oh, we love you. We'll take care of you. So I feel like I remember myself like really liking whenever Frodo was injured, whenever I was younger and being like, oh, what's going to happen? And so that brought back yeah. the- weirdly good memories i was like oh yeah no i i get what you mean because it's like before before then it feels like there aren't really any stakes to this but now it's like no he's in trouble and things are serious he might turn into a ring wraith we yeah. think maybe it's intense and i'm a writer too so like i'm you know it's my writer instinct to be like i want this character to get hurt or something and see how everyone else reacts and then have you know a cute scene where they're taking care of their friend and they love them and they, you know, beg them not to die or something. I don't know. It's like, that's the writer in me that's just like, yes, I love the Hurt the characters, yeah. break them, see what happens. <laughs> break them. Break all their bones. <laughs> Basically. Oh, man. Now I'm sitting here and I'm like, how do I end this episode? I don't know. I'm just excited about the fact that actual stuff is happening now because before there was so much was not happening over the span of so many pages. Yeah, and it's so nice like, that what is happening now isn't just the result of the hobbits like falling asleep somewhere they shouldn't. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Like it's actual actual action propelling the plot forward as opposed to just the hobbits messing up. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about this chapter. What what would you like to plug? Well, for anyone out there that doesn't know, I am the co-host of a podcast called Unreliable Narrators. Me and my best friend Maggie co-host it every Thursday. We talk about a whole bunch of nerdy things and the art of storytelling. So We've so far we've already talked about Marvel musicals. Uh, the episode that just recently came out. As the time I'm recording it, this 
it's coming out tomorrow, but by the time this comes out, it would have been next last week, was a Pokemon episode that we had. We just talk about everything. We argue a little bit, friendly bickering, and it's a lot of fun. You can find Unreliable Narrators on pretty much any podcast streaming platform. You can also find the podcast on Twitter, at UnreliablePod, and at our new website, which is unreliablepodcast.wordpress.com. And if you just want to talk to me, I am on Twitter a lot, at Kiara underscore Kalmi. If you need to know how to spell my name, just look in the title of this. Yeah, I was going to say, it'll, Maggie, yeah, it'll all be in the show notes, so don't worry Maggie about makes, it, kids. Maggie makes fun of me because whenever we are recording, every single time I say my Twitter handle, I always spell it out. And she's like, you always spell it out. And I'm like, yes, because no one in the history of mankind has ever pronounced or spelled my name right on the first try. I just want people to find me. I got you. Uh, yeah, I I understand. <laughs> Shoot, my brain is... Oh, um, I was listening to y'all's episode where you did the Pottermore sorting and quizzes and stuff. Because yes. it was just weird timing because I was having, not a fight, a bickering with Tyler and Ethan about whether or not I'm a Slytherin or a Gryffindor. And I'm like, guys, I'm a Slytherin. Just don't worry about it. And they're like, you are 100% a Gryffindor. You made a podcast on a dare. I said, no, I made a podcast on a dumb idea and impulsive Aries <laughs> energy. <laughs> and now I'm afraid. And then like, I think the next day or something, y'all came out with the pot- the Pottermore episode came out or something, and I was like, "That's just too freaky about the timing." Because <laughs> we were we were just arguing about what it means to ask the ha- like the translation of like in the books, Harry asks the hat. So what does that mean in the technology world where the hat is an online quiz? And I was saying that I took the quiz twice because I got Slytherin the first time and I was so concerned. I thought I had tricked the hat because I was like, I want Slytherin, I am a Slytherin and I got Slytherin and I was like, I tricked the hat. There's no way this is, I'm a, I was like, I'm a fraud. And so I made a second account and did the quiz again and got Slytherin again. And Ethan was like, yeah, that's called asking the hat. And asking the hat is a Gryffindor trait. I was like, no, it's not. It just so happens that the people who ask the hat happen to be Gryffindors. And he's like, but you took the quiz second, a second time. So that means you were asking the hat. I said, no, asking the hat would have been me taking the quiz again and hoping for a different outcome. I was hoping for the same outcome. Anyway. I will gladly welcome you into Slytherin with me. We are an awesome house. <laughs> okay, honestly, though, whenever I listen to the one Bacon and Eggs Sunday brunch from forever ago, when Tyler and Ethan did the Pottermore sort of quiz, and, like, they both got Ravenclaw, I was sitting there, and I'm like, Ethan, are you sure you want to Slytherin? <laughs> Like, like all the times I've talked to Ethan, I'm just like, I feel like you're a Slytherin, like the best way, but I feel like you are. Oh, it's but. so funny you say that because I was, yeah, I was like arguing with them about something dumb. And I was like, yeah, this is what happens when a Slytherin ta- is in a group message with two Gryffindors. And they're like, neither of us are Gryffindors. And I was like, I don't <laughs> believe that for a minute, but okay. <laughs> I could see that too. I could see definitely. I guess like- it makes I guess it makes sense that they're Ravenclaws if they have a podcast that is based on a lot of, I mean, it's it's a movie podcast, but it's also based on, like, nerd culture, a lot of. Yeah. So, guess that makes sense. All right, Tyler and Ethan, I'll give you a pass. <laughs> and feel free to message me in the Discord and be angry at me for calling you a Slytherin, Ethan, I'm sorry. <laughs> Speaking of Discord, you can join the Bacon and Eggs Discord for $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash bacon and eggs. And we have a fun little group there, and uh, we have a thread for this podcast, That's What I'm Talking About, and threads for lots of other things. What else am I supposed to talk about? Oh, That's What I'm Talking About is a production of Bacon and Eggs. You can go to baconandeggs.media to learn more. The cover art is by Vaishan Brandon. Go support him on Instagram at graphite.vmb. You can find the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Tolkien About Pod. You can find me on Twitter at mcwatt416. You can find me on Instagram at mcturndownforwatt. Man, that's so many things to have to talk about. <laughs> But so many wonderful I just love your Instagram handle so much. Thank you. I spent 
a long time trying to come up with it. I think I was, oh, that's right. I remember exactly when I made my Instagram account. I was up until like 3 a.m. studying for my 8 a.m. exam. And I was like, you know what would be a great idea right now if I made an Instagram account? <laughs> That's what I did. Anyway, so, um, yeah, go do Just look all that up on the internet. We're all on the internet every hour of our lives anyway nowadays. So go look all that stuff up on the internet because it's all great. Thanks so much for coming on again. Everyone go check out Kiara and Maggie's podcast. I almost said, that's what I'm talking about. I'm like, that's not the name of your podcast. (laughs) The name of your podcast is Unreliable Theory. (laughs) Oh my Yes. What was that noise? Sorry, I'm going to have to go back in the audio. There was some loud boom, and I don't know if it came from in the apartment or outside the apartment. This is like an auditory horror experience now, so I'm going <laughs> to leave it with this, and that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs>